Have you ever dreamt of tearing up your front lawn to grow your own food? You're not alone, but if you haven't done it yet, something is likely holding you back. Maybe it's that you're not quite sure about the best steps to take to bring that dream garden to life, or perhaps you're just nervous about your project being on display for everyone in the neighborhood, along with all of its successes and struggles along the way. If any of those thoughts have crossed your mind, stay tuned. This is the story of a young couple in our Seed to Table community who decided to make the most of their sunny front yard by totally transforming it into a productive source of food for their growing family. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Murray and Elena from Calgary, Alberta. Um, I'm Elena. I am a teacher. I also have a dance studio with my sister that uh, her and I own together. So pretty busy, but um, lots of fun and I really enjoy it. And I'm Murray. I do some front-end web development, if anyone knows what that is. But yeah, I'm, I went to film school, actually, is what I got my degree oh. in. But I'm generally, uh, like you said, a techie kind of guy. And I love just building things in general. That'd be my top thing. Okay. Also worth noting that we're expecting our first baby in like six to eight weeks. So we're pretty excited. Uh, and actually a lot of the decisions we made last year were knowing that we were going to be starting our family this year. So While Murray and Elena are both busy professionals, they also had a dream of living a more sustainable lifestyle. So when they encountered an opportunity for a front yard makeover, they were ready to leap into vegetable growing wholeheartedly. Not last year, but years previous, we had been just sort of dabbling in fun gardening for the sake of it, like one tomato plant or a few things here and there and then felt like it was worthwhile to try and expand that and we also kind of were hit by circumstance our house flooded within two weeks of us buying it and it turns out that <laughs> the way that the slope of the land is it kind of pools water right into our basement windows so i wanted to install some french drains around the perimeter of the property and in doing so that kind of churned up a bunch of dirt in the yard and we had these little retaining walls installed and stuff so the front yard was kind of a write-off at the time anyway and we figured well we could restore it we could make a new nice lawn or something but what's the point in growing grass when we could actually use that space for something so that kind of switched the direction a bit changed gears so that we thought okay let's do let's go pretty hard into gardening here just kind of separately from that we were also sort of starting our sustainability journey and just kind of trying to make more eco-friendly choices and so it was good timing that like when we were trying to decide what to have happen with the front yard that we were also making all of these eco-friendly decisions. So Marie and Elena had a clear picture of their goal, but they also had obstacles standing in their way with several large trees on and around their property and a front yard covered with backfill. They recognized that there were some key decisions ahead of them and wanted to make sure they did things the right way the first time. They made the decision to join the Seed to Table program and proceeded to map out and prepare their entire garden site with confidence. We bought a broad fork. And we decided that because we now owned a broad fork, we were officially farmers. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we did a pass of the broad fork down where the beds would be. And we, we didn't step there as we knew we were building it. But we bought some pre-made compost mix from a local provider. Okay. Poured that in through, yeah, as you can see, through the wheelbarrow. No machinery could get in there. So we had to hand bomb all of that. And then we put the tarps in, or sorry, the, the landscaping fabric, pinned that down. And then we used some purchased cedar wood chips, which... I don't know if anyone's ever used them, but they smell heavenly Amazing. as you're yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, And they look great, especially when they're fresh and they're still a little red. And our, our soil is very like clay-like here. So it's like thick and tough. Which is why we then broad forked it again. So now that the compost was on top, we wanted to work it down and to keep loosening stuff up. So we went through yeah. all of those again with another broad fork. And the, the broad fork that we got is, it's fun. Like it's actually a really fun to use and just get on there and shake it around and stuff so which that, that story at least is pretty easy and it's not it's not really hard to use is it like it seems like you can churn up a bunch of soil with that thing and you're not performing a lot of physical labor because of all the leverage it gives you so mm -hmm. yeah i'm glad you went through that again so the beds are looking sharp at this point and what's the the tarping motivation here uh, all those trees nearby are always blowing things off like there's always um, flowers and whatnot coming down. So if we just left it, it would be covered in in organic stuff. And I figured a lot of that organic stuff might include weeds or just like general stuff kicking about. So we figured we'd cover it to prevent any weeds from settling. And also if there was any weeds in the soil, they're not going to get as much lighter or moisture to uh, 
get an early start. Um, I think it was even in the compost that we got, like when we pulled the tarp back, there was a lot of like really, really stringy weed seeds that were like, you know, when they don't get enough water or sorry, yep. sunlight, they like get really long. And obviously if we hadn't tarped them, then those would have turned into something and would have made a lot more work for us. So it was good yep. that we did it. Drip irrigation was the best move we made for sure. Very roughly, we just ran two hoses around the perimeter on the outside edges of both so that our path didn't have to be crossed with a hose or anything. Okay. And then from those fed in one shot into each bed, they were very effective. I think they, uh, the beds were always wet when they thought they would be and stuff. Okay. Then we get to some exciting stuff. Tell us what's going on here. Are you going to tell them about drilling or burning the holes? That was Jared's recommendation. Use that, the blowtorch and burn some holes through and absolutely loved how that turned out. It looks really nice and clean. And when we peeled up those at the end of the season, we realized just how effective they are. In fact, we're going to expand that this year because we didn't do it on all of the things we thought maybe these plants might need extra space, but I'm going to do it as much as possible because it just made for so much less work weeding. And also, I think we're going to talk about this a bit later too, but um, it just looked a lot neater having like the plant and then the fabric around it with nothing it kept things looking clean and pristine, I think. Covers is, is the next one here. You built these beautiful hoops inspired by Chris. Chris is here today. So Chris, thanks for sharing your design. But the forms worked really nicely for Marie and Elena. The floating row cover we used early in the season when we put our first stuff in uh, when it was still too cold out at night. But once it got warm enough at night, we switched to the insect netting and loved it. Like Lainey said, people would always, they always asked about these. They thought that these looked cool or professional or something. And um, I, yeah, totally props to Chris for posting that thing because I straight up just copied the design and bent <laughs> the stuff. But they all said, where did you buy these? And I was like, well, we made them. Here's the website. Yeah, check yeah. out the designs. Now, even though Murray and Elena had a good plan for their growing space, creating a garden in a front yard still felt like a bit of a risk. In a neighborhood where front yard lawns are the norm, they were concerned about what their neighbors might think about this dramatic change. You know you're proud of your garden when you climb on the roof of your house, too. <laughs> <laughs> really um, I actually think this would be a good spot to talk about the fact that when we were starting our, like when we decided that we weren't going to lay grass and we were going to turn it into an urban garden, we were really worried about what neighbors would say and the reaction from people around in the neighborhood. Um, because we live in an older established neighborhood and 95, maybe even more percent of the lawns are just fully grass and like nicely tended to lawns. So we were a bit worried about that. But as you can see from this photo, um, we tried to keep things really neat and it's very organized. And I think that we didn't have a lot of, in fact, actually, we didn't have any negative comments at all. And I think that the reason is because it was organized and it looked good and everything was the way it needed to be and neat and tidy so that um, it didn't sort of just look like a jungle when everybody else's lawns are clean and and fully grassed and that sort of thing. So It was actually such a treat to be out gardening because at least once a week, someone you've never met would come by and say, wow, look at what you're doing here. And like, <laughs> it, was, it was very cool. Oh, literally nothing but 100% positive comments. I can say the same thing for our, our boulevard plots. I don't know why it's a point of contention in, for some people or a point of uh, hesitancy, but I think it just stems from other projects that have been less organized. If it turns into a vegetable jungle and you see rotting tomatoes out there I think, and it's clearly not well kept, then then that gives gardening a bad bad reputation. But if, if this is the reputation you're presenting of gardening, then that has the potential to really ripple throughout your community. And I've, I've seen that snowball in some communities that I've been connected with and it's inspiring. So maybe it'll catch on in some other households down the street. Well, I think it will because um, some of the people who stopped by to talk to us would say, I've been thinking about wanting to do something with my front yard and I'm not sure what I want to do with it. Or I've been thinking about wanting to start a garden and I didn't know how to get started. And also just want to say that we would always direct them to your website because <laughs> we were like, this is, this is how we got started and it was great. So this is what you should do being fully truthful like we don't know what we're doing until this website showed up so um, but and i know someone's going to be watching this eventually and wondering because i always get asked this question did anything get stolen like is was theft a problem where people did you notice things were missing not a single thing not, i don't even think a strawberry was nicked oh and those are right around the, on the front here even they're just yeah. begging people to snack on a strawberry <laughs> 
I but literally was like, yeah, go help we yourself. We wouldn't have been <laughs> upset if they had taken them, but no, nothing was taken. Maria and Elena have accomplished so much in just one year, but we are continuing to work together to clarify their big goals and break them down into manageable steps. Now that their basic garden site is established, they get to fine tune the details of their operations so that the tasks of growing, harvesting and storage fit more smoothly into their lifestyle. We had tried like a lot of different types of crops this year and we did it on purpose because we just wanted to like try everything once and see what we were successful with and what sort of matched our expectations in terms of like how much work we had to put in and the output. I spoke about your diverse crop selection at the start there, mentioning it as, as a challenge, but like it's also, as Elena said, it's a learning opportunity. The more you try, the more learning opportunities you have. The thing to remember is that you need to just be present and observing to acquire those learning experiences. If you plant a lot of crops and then you aren't there to make those lessons sink in, then you can't absorb that, but I think you've been very present and your your plot was cared for and you noticed the things that you were supposed to be noticing along the way. So you will have picked up a lot in just your first season. And actually we learned a little bit about ourselves too, because we planted um, a bunch of squash and then <clears throat> learned that we don't actually eat a lot of squash. Right? <laughs> so it, they did really well, but it's probably not the best choice for us. So yeah, um, I actually was just thinking about how effective the preservation has been. We haven't, we have dried herbs that we have used and we're going to probably have enough for like at least a year or two with what we got from this summer's batch. So that was really effective. And then we did can some carrots and some cucumbers and we did a few tomato sauces as well. We're definitely going to do a little bit more there this year. Tons of tomatoes coming, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, that was, it's been like really easy to just go downstairs and get some tomato sauce that we've made just as easy as buying a can from the store. So. <laughs> Isn't that great just walking downstairs in the middle of winter, it's snow everywhere and you can just go grab some of your own food. It's like, so satisfying. <laughs> people say like, gardening takes time in the summer and it does it take some time, but we don't go to the grocery store to get all this stuff anymore. It's just downstairs. It's just a matter of switching the time investment to a different spot instead of going to the grocery store every day or every four days here canning tomatoes sometimes so so we would like to this year come up with some sort of a system where we can keep things for a bit longer because there's no point in growing all of these wonderful crops if then we're going to waste them because we can't store them for long enough we're really happy to share what we've grown yeah. but at the same time in terms of sustainability the the purpose is for us to grow things so that we can sustain ourselves over winter and so we definitely need to come up with a storage system that'll work for us so that we can do onions and potatoes and carrots and on all those things and keep them for as long as possible. And of course that excites me because it's stuff to build <laughs> maybe, but uh, the problem right now we're facing is we just don't have any space. And I think back to one of the first lessons in the seed table course talks about the long-term picture of your infrastructure goals. Like it's, it's, this is a long-term journey. If you just try to do it all at once and feel, or feel like you're supposed to do it all at once, you'll just burn out or feel like you're always failing. At least that's yeah. the emotion that comes up in me all the time is like there's just the dream is so big if we just keep that big dream in front of us all the time and and lose track of those little steps along the way then it starts to feel like it's just never going to be possible but so yeah baby steps and especially this year literally baby steps yeah. your, your situation it's always amazing to see the transformation that can happen in just one growing season especially when you're guided by an experienced teacher and structured learning community if you are dreaming of a vegetable garden makeover of your own know that you are capable of this type of transformation too. To get started right now, click the link below this video to register for my next free training. And if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel to let me know you'd like to see more stories like this in the future. I'll see you in the next one.